Welcome every, everyone. Welcome to the CGH webinar on virtual global health educational approaches and advances. I'm Dr. Jessica Everett and I'm the Global Medical Director of Child Family Health International and it's such an honor to be here. Um, as everyone's filing into our virtual convening space here, I welcome you to introduce yourself in the, the chat. Um, please include um, who you are, where you are, and what your passion is in this realm. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Keith Martin, the Executive Director of CGH, to dis discuss some um, upcoming opportunities. Welcome, Keith. Thank you very much, Jessica. Well, on behalf of everybody here at CGH, as Dr. Ebert said, thank you so much for attending this session. And a big thanks from all of us to Dr. Ebert for leading this effort, Drs. McFarlane, Ahmed, Wendell, Bitsalabejo, um, Packen and Walsh uh, for, for actually being speakers on the session. And at the end of this session, uh, it'll be, it's gonna be taped, it'll be on CUGH's website. Please share it with your networks. So as Dr. Ebert said, we've got a couple of really important uh, announcements for you to participate in. First, our Global Health Conference is coming up in Los Angeles. It'll be March 7th to the 10th. Uh, please submit your panels and abstracts and satellite workshops before September the 30th. That's really important and encourage folks to attend and register in Los Angeles. But before that, in order to have access for people around the world who might not be able to attend Los Angeles, we're holding a Global Health Week virtually, open to all and free to attend. And that will be October 30th to uh, November the 3rd. The deadline to submit panels and sessions for that are, is going to be, uh, it'll be September the 25th. So www.cugh2024.org, uh, please take a look at that. Submit your uh, your panels for the virtual workshop deadline September 25th, and again for September 30th for our meeting next here in Los Angeles. And it's Global Health Without Borders, as you can see from the slides that Dr. Ebert is putting up. So back to you, Dr. Ebert, and thanks everybody for attending this wonderful session. Thanks, Jess. Absolutely, and I want to um, recognize the education subcommittee of CGH where this webinar was really born out of, um, and thanks to those leaders. I want to introduce our speakers today, which are um, really gathering on a wide array of virtual global health educational approaches. We have Dr. Danish Ahmed Maud, excuse me, who is the population health lecturer and global health researcher in the School of Medicine and Psychology at the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia. We have Dr. Akiki Bitalabejo, who is the assistant professor and head of the Godly St. Gore Department of Community Health in the University for Global Health Equity in Rwanda. We have Dr. Ro McFarlane, the head of public health discipline at the University of Canberra in Australia, who is co-creator of iPelican with Dr. Ahmad. We also have Dr. Neil Packenham Walsh, who is the founder of Healthcare Information for All and director of the Global Healthcare Information Network in the United Kingdom. And we have Hope Wendell, who is the director of the COIL Center at the State University of New York in the US. So welcome to all our speakers. I want to, uh, being an educational webinar, make sure that we are outlining our learning objectives and you can see them there. We hope to really explore an array of virtual global health educational approaches, really provide an overview of COIL, which is collaborative online international learning, as well as the approaches to virtual health professions, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and healthcare information for all. And then discuss some of the pitfalls, pearls, and how we create enabling systems around uh, virtual global health um, education. So without further ado, I will welcome our first speaker who is going to be Hope Wendell from the COIL Center at SUNY. Welcome, Hope. Welcome, welcome everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen. And while I do, if everybody could in the chat, please share a greeting in your mother tongue, because what COIL is all about is um, connecting to each other all over the place. So it'd be great to um, see um, the language of all of our mother tongues. So can't wait to see that. Um, so 
Can everybody see my slide? I'm going to put it on slideshow. And it's loading. And here we are. All right. Welcome, everybody. And let me just open up the chat so I can see. Oh, there's a howdy. And I love all of this. And actually, if we could unmute and if everybody could speak, I would love that even more. But unfortunately, um, you can only hear me. So here we go. So COIL, um, Collaborative Online International Learning. We are now in 157 institutions around the world. This year, we worked with over 60,000 students in 28 countries and six continents. This is a pedagogy that has caught fire, especially during the pandemic. And it's um, something that is here to stay. This is something for everyone. And so there's many players in the uh, COIL virtual exchange community. And I just am giving a shout out to many of the players that I know about, but there's many more and probably in the global health sphere, even more. And you probably have been doing something that is similar or is virtual exchange and um, you just didn't call it that. So um, welcome aboard to a fast ride of what this is. And so um, please add in the chat if you do know what COIL is or if you have been participating in some kind of form of online international collaborative um, learning. I always like to hear what people are up to. Um, so while you think about whether or not you have been doing it, in a nutshell, just the basic, simple understanding of what COIL is, is that it's a collaboration between two professors and two groups of students in two different institutions. And there could also be a community organization at either location or um, one location that both are working with. The collaboration might be in one language, it might be in two languages, it might even be each country speaks a language and they come together speaking a third language. So there's lots of ways that it can happen, right? And how it works is if you think of when you develop an online course, it's similar to that in that you have outcomes that you figure out with a partner, your professor partner or your community organization partner. You figure out how long you're going to connect, what technology you're going to use, and um, you're going to monitor how your students are connecting, but you're going to be coaching your students to work together. The point of COIL is that the students are working together. It's not about professors lecturing each other. The students are working on issues together or they're problem solving. They're creating, figuring out how to take an unequitable situation and what they can do at either location to make a more equitable um, opportunity for all. So COIL can be very customizable for whatever situation you're in. If you're um, preparing nurses for um, their experience in education, or you are um, thinking about it with a travel opportunity, or you're thinking about it with your research, these are all ways that people have been doing COIL since I've been working on it in 2006. It started 2004, but there was telecollaboration even earlier, right? So what? how does this break down? So usually you do this with an icebreaker as with whenever we start anything, we always want to have some sort of way that let's build some trust with each other. We want to have some kind of discussion, getting to know each other, and some project that we're working on. 
And students today, as you all know, they want to work on something that is vital to their community, that is something that they know that um, everyone will benefit from. So usually we find um, projects through the professors that is near and dear to their research or to what they're doing. And um, you use technology that's available to you. Here I am with my phone. I can use um, WhatsApp as the connecting tool. I know that other colleagues on the call will also be talking about WhatsApp or Telegram or Slack. You don't need any more technology than your phone. And we also are aware of, you know, some people are paying as they go and some people aren't. So how do you make sure that that interaction is equitable with the technology you use by just staying to text? And so that's um, uh, that you can translate easily, that you can share images, that you want to create um, opportunities in low bandwidth ways so that everybody has a chance to participate and be a part of no matter what's going on. There might be a, um, a giant flood happening in one of the communities where this is happening. But if you can connect by phone, um, then you're still going to be able to have that collaboration work. So in a nutshell, you are facilitating. Professors are coaching students through this project-oriented opportunity. This is not an opportunity for pen pals. This is not an open course. This is not an opportunity for just lecturing to students, but we're putting the students in the center of what they're doing. Um, here are a couple of examples, and I'll put the link to this in the chat so that you can read articles by your peers who are doing work, um, doing COIL. And there are so many ways that students just get thrilled about doing this work. This is work of joy because you're finding out about each other. You're finding out about each other as peers, and you're doing something that the students realize will propel them forward in a coached environment so that they will have more strength and courage to reach out moving forward in their career and in their academics and moving forward. Oop, double on that. And so here's an example of how it might unfold, right? You have these icebreakers we're talking about and student teams and then maybe you're talking about food insecurity in Yemen and Venezuela. Those two institutions are talking together about how are we solving this locally on our in our community, on our campus, and what happens when you have food insecurity and chronic disease? And are you going to connect this to sustainable development goals and how? And having that umbrella so that if you're teaching one course that's more maybe chemistry oriented and someone else is teaching something that is about um, infectious diseases, how do you come together, right? Oh, so, hope we yeah. have two minutes left just to- Thank you, perfect, um, okay. So as we all know, we are looking for activities that are hands-on and career ready for our students. And this is one of those kinds of activities that ticks all the boxes. And um, we want to make sure our students are in the center of what their education experience is. And that's what this is all about. And that's what Bettina Love talks about. And that's what we're doing here with COIL. And truly, this is about the fact that we cannot do without this work. We need to prepare and so that our students can do this in the world. They need to be able to reflect on their own experience compared to their um, international partner. How do you prepare for a career in global health, but trying to connect with people through culture? understanding high and low tech, low context communicating and how to collaborate. So all of these things are part of the process. And so 
it really comes down to a simple thing. At least two instructors, two classes, two cohorts, many cultures, you know, it's not just one or two and two or more languages. And these are the considerations. What, what are the timing? That's why much of the work happens online or hybrid, right? So these are all things to consider. And if you're interested, this is sort of the flow of how it works. You're interested in it. You might talk to somebody on your campus or if you're an administrator, you come talk to me and we'll get going. You take some courses and then you design a project and you consider your academic calendars and you find that sweet spot between the calendars. We help you find a partner and we have fairs for that. And we have hubs where we meet and we have courses for you to take. And so if you go to coil.suny.edu, you can understand how you talk through culture, even if there are different ways that we work together through our culture, how we work online, how we design that project, and how as an administrator, how do we implement this on our campus and in our program? So, so I, I'm just, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, but I really appreciate those resources and just want to um, honor the other speaker's time. Thank uh -huh. you so much. Okay, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. More to come in the question and answer session. I want to welcome Dr. Akiki Bitalabejo. Um, welcome, Akiki. Yes, good day. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I am going to present on work that has been done at University of Global Health Equity. I will start with a background to who we are and the importance of social and community medicine as a background to describing the case study that I will share. And this is depicted in um, a two uh, video clips where the late uh, Dr. Paul Farmer and I feature. So we have for me three universities, a university with walls in the form of UGHE. We have a university with patients, which is Butaro Hospital. Then we have a university without walls, which is the community. The three of them are very important. We'll give. Our students need to understand the science, the biology, you know, the medications, but at the same time, the understanding of what it takes at the community level to craft these and tailor these according to the community. Whether you call it social medicine or One Health or look at community interactions or how health and social justice come to be. We don't think it should be an option not to understand these other questions. We are oriented such that our students are patient focused, they are community oriented, and they are globally aware. And we cannot train quality health professionals without a hospital where our patients go to. Um, so that's a, a little background to how we value uh, social and community medicine. Now, in the times of COVID, UGHE invested uh, substantially in virtual teaching platforms. Faculty were trained, infrastructure was developed, and we were able to continue our teaching. Now, I'm not going to address this today. I'm sure some of my colleagues on the, on the webinar are going to go into that. The hospitals, which is also the third university that we talked about, they too adapted so that we could reach people because we are all about reaching people. And up to the, up to the point of even using uh, drones to deliver drugs to hard to reach 
places. Interestingly, it was what I we termed as the university without walls, where COVID ironically built um, formidable walls and we could not get into. How were we going to do this? The case study that I will describe just uh, illustrates how we tried to make sure that whatever we do, uh, Zoom calls, virtual platforms, we would still remain in touch with the people who our uh, re uh, reason of being. Uh, the objective uh, of making sure that our, our our students were, you know, stayed in touch was so that they would be familiar with the conditions in which people are born, live, and work, so that they would comprehend the social determinants that influence life experience, health, and disease, so that they would understand what influences health-seeking behavior, what promotes effective health services and care. And finally, to walk the journey of their patients and the caregivers, because whatever was happening and will happen, patients and caregivers do have physical walks that they walk, and our students need to walk in these footsteps. To introduce the origin of the pedagogy that I will explain, there was a desire um, uh, to inspire our students indeed, to know, as I said, the people and the environment where people live, where they themselves learn and where they practice. And this began uh, many years ago, uh, actually in, in South Africa uh, at the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, the university tasked us with preparing the students to be ready to serve the post-apartheid rainbow nation wherever they were found. And uh, prior to this, students were taught in very um, uh, formidable uh, universities like the University of Witwatersrand, Rand, but really out of touch with what was going on beyond the walls. COVID for us brought that back, that uh, we, we were in danger of of having students that we were seeing on Zoom calls, but were out of touch. And therefore we thought of doing virtual accompaniment in COVID times in this pedagogy called Walk the Talk. This uh, picture just shows what I just said, the, the genesis of that pedagogy of Walk the Talk with showing you on on the on the left, uh, Vitz University, and juxtaposed to that, the metropolis of Johannesburg, and beyond that, the rural area. So we, in Walk the Talk, we hope that this is just an introduction to what we expect our health caregivers to do, to always walk the, you know, go where our patients uh, live and where we also work. This is a, a teaching platform in the normal times where we have found it necessary to take even our students in uh, Rwanda from Kigali, from the city, from the University of Rwanda, to bring them into the rural area and take them uh, to see where our, our people live from and what they can learn from, from platforms that are outside walls. That's a water tank and that's a vantage point and a, a well thought out um, platform because it talks about the importance and the scarcity and the scarcity of water. This is uh, later on at the University of Global Health Equity with international students, taking them from our beautiful campus that is on the left and taking them into those hills that you see so that they can see what it actually means to physically seek uh, health care if you are an inhabitant of that place. Walk the Talk has got a pedagogy. It has, we start uh, with uh, planning the walk with uh, objectives. We plan the walk itself uh, with uh, very detailed. We plan what the open air classrooms are going to be, what are the visuals, who are the facilitators, who are the storytellers, who are the connectors. 
And then the data is collected through observations, listening, sensing, and assessing what is happening. And then this is brought together by reflections with questions that will, will, will anchor the learning that is done outside. In the times of COVID, the problem was how were we going to mimic this? Because we did start with the planning, with the video, uh, with the Zoom calls, where we explained what uh, this was, and that instead now of students being accompanied physically by a facilitator, by faculty, they would have to look for a facilitator in the community. And this many times was a healthcare worker at a health facility because those people were still working or to look for an inhabitant of the place who knew the place more than them. We, we inspired them to go to places they had not been. It was lo lockdown, uh, there was a restriction, but life was still happening. And they, we have about a minute left, just FYI. Okay. So then uh, after that, they would come back and uh, post what, what they had learned on a virtual platform, and there would be interaction on the virtual platform uh, by peers discussing and the faculty giving an input in what had happened and assessing it. Uh, I think I'll stop there and say that there is no excuse for not doing, for not going out there and walking the talk of the classroom. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for not letting us hide in those excuses. Um, I want to welcome um, Dr. Danish um, Ahmad and Dr. Ro McFarlane. Welcome from the university, excuse me, the national, the Australian National University. Welcome. Thanks very much, Jessica, and thank you, CEO GH, for hosting us, and welcome again, participants. Now, while I quickly um, share my slides, I might share that iPelican is an initiative that was co-developed by two Australian universities that are co-located in Canberra, which is Australia's capital city, and we had an international partner based in India. Now, this work is also being produced by other team members who aren't with us um, right now. Um, I'll be presenting the initial part of iPelican, and then I'll hand over to Ro to talk us through the remaining part. Now, as is customary in Australia, I would like to start off with an acknowledgement of country and share that both our universities acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, who are the traditional custodians of the lands where our campuses in Canberra are situated. And we both wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and their contribution that they make to the life of Canberra and the region. And I also acknowledge all other First Nation peoples on whose lands we gather and participants who may be joining us online. Now, iPelican was essentially an initiative which was born out of a desire to promote a new way of teaching that would allow for greater student-to-student -student engagement internationally using a way of online engagement that allowed students to have authentic real-time engagement without the additional burdens of cost or time. We recognize that in teaching global health in many of our own courses, we have students that are co-located in campuses in different parts of the world, but they may not be able to engage with each other and there's a sense that traditional classroom teaching pedagogies don't always allow for students to meet and exchange views. So iPelican started as a teaching research grant that the University of Canberra had initially provided, which then grew into a proof of concept idea, which linked uh, University of Canberra, that's us in one corner of the world, with IIPHG, which is the Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhinagar, a university that offers teaching and degrees in public health in India. Now, essentially, in 2022, both our schools, ANU and University of Canberra, 
uh, designed, implemented, and evaluated as proof of concept iPelican, which is a virtual practice-based module to supplement classroom teaching. And what we mean by that was that this is a, a way to teach that was embedded in existing classroom sessions. So it didn't require additional time commitment for students outside of what they were already enrolled into. And we wanted to create a way of learning and engagement that used existing technology, which would be affordable without additional cost and potentially replicable in different places. So we worked with a learning and teaching designer to come up with a pedagogy that essentially structured four online tutorials which were approximately two hours each. And the entire iPelican session was conducted over 10 hours total. And we had structured each session to target one key area of a global health skill that would allow for greater knowledge development, skill development, and ultimately applied focus. Now, this scaffolding that we see on the screen is essentially the outline of what the module essentially look like. And we haven't put in prescriptive ideas here because the, the module itself was designed in a way that would allow for greater exchange and for it to be replicable with different partners. Now, most of the sessions were conducted in Zoom and the pedagogy essentially allowed us to think through developing a way of engagement where we could think about what was happening in different parts of Zoom. So like we're joining today in the main room of Zoom, the, the main room of Zoom was a place where both behaviors and initial knowledge exchange was occurring between learning instructors, which were often staff members. And that was linked to then breakout room activities where students worked with each other to conduct various group discussions on their own without the presence of a facilitator. And then they would come back to the main room and showcase what their collective work had been. Now, this is an example of one of the slides where we use Padlet, which is a freely available software. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Ro, to talk us through the rest of the slides. Thanks, Danish. This is a terrific interactive um, opportunity where we ask students to, first of all, it's an icebreaker, to bring some photos that explained their cultural um, origins but later we developed this to be able to explain social determinants of health. And you can see a bit of a mix up of different photos. And we can't show you slides which show people's faces, but each student brought to this platform rich, deep stories. And it's this visuals and the stories which absolutely um, inspired the peer-to-peer -peer learning. We went from this sort of exercise to delving more deeply into specific issues. And at the end of the session, what we asked students to do is to again use Padlet to create an e-poster. And what you're seeing here now is an e-poster on care-seeking behaviour for tuberculosis in India. But in this particular session, we had the... Um, Students go away and look at one of two case studies, one being migrant health or refugee health in Australia, one being issues around tuberculosis in India, and not know which group or which um, case study they were going to be given. And then in their session, students put together this comprehensive e-poster working on the framework, in this case, the social determinants of health that we had been modelling and working with throughout the sessions. Absolutely terrific work, obviously draft, but a real co-collaboration. So we're absolutely thrilled. There's lots of things we've gained from this. We've become very good partners with our colleagues in IOPHG. We've got great ANU and University of Canberra um, collaborations as well. But we involved our HDR students as tutors, both in the Indian institution and the Australian institution. So we've upskilled a large group of um, ongoing staff to work on these projects. And again, this year we've started again 
with our new session within our global health. Um, we've had some terrific awards, we've had publications, and we've seen the experience um, recognised in, in a number of different ways. So one of the things that I want to talk, and you can read more about this in the Frontiers in Public Health article that we have published on this, is how we assess students, because this was something, not only the pedagogy of designing the projects, but also to make sure that we got real outcomes. And we embedded feedback through an outreach session, but we also utilised a international education survey tool at the end and also qualitative feedback. And we've gone to great lengths to make sure that we can document and review what we've done and see that we're getting the outcomes of genuine, authentic peer-to-peer -peer learning, which, of course, is so essential to really bring global health alive, as, as Danish spoke at the beginning. So going forward, um, we would love to expand this. We've got a terrific relationship with the Indian Institute of Public Health in Gandanaga, but we recognise that this is only the first step as we connect with more and more global partners. And we'd love to hear expressions of interest. If you are got ideas, if you would like to engage with us, you are so welcome and we would love to hear from you. And I think that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that perspective. And I hope everyone is um, cataloging all the opportunities for collaboration. Um, feel free to put links and emails in the chat function so folks can follow up. Um, I want to invite Neil uh, Packenham Walsh from HIFA um, to join us and enlighten us on the approach of healthcare information for all. Welcome, Neil. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, my name is Neil Packenham Walsh. I am the coordinator of Healthcare Information for All, and I'm based near Oxford in the UK. Uh, greetings to everyone. Just share my slides if I can. Okay, well, our work is relevant to this webinar in two respects. Firstly, we are a community of practice um, around global health communication. Secondly, our content, what we actually discuss, is about education and learning. But I'm going to focus, for the purpose of this webinar, on the first and to describe what healthcare information for all is and how it works. Well, HIFA is a community of practice, and this is defined as a group of people who share a concern or a passion about something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. I see HIFA as a special type of community of practice, and that is a community of purpose. And HIFA's purpose is to create a world where every person has access to the information they need to protect their own health and the health of others. I'll now say a little bit about why HIFA is needed, what we're trying to achieve and how we work. So why, why HIFA is needed is basically because people are dying for lack of basic healthcare information. There are 8 million deaths per year in low and middle income countries due to poor quality care. Now, of course, information isn't, only, isn't the only factor here, it's but one of many. Failure to access and apply healthcare information is a major cause of avoidable death and suffering. And it's not just parents, families and patients who sometimes and often lack access, it's health workers too. And this all contributes to poor quality of care at all levels from self-care through family care, primary care and hospital care. Now, in order for everybody to have access to reliable healthcare information, we need a functional global evidence ecosystem. 
And this refers to the totality of health research, the publishing of that research, health uh, research synthesis, as in systematic reviews, packaging information so that it's applicable and usable by different audiences, helping people find the information and actually applying it. And in a, uh, in a Lancet article in 2004 with Fiona Godley, the former uh, BMJ editor-in-chief, we identified three systemic weaknesses in this system. First, there's poor communication among the stakeholders. Second, there's poor understanding of information needs and how to meet them. And lastly, there's poor advocacy for the goal of universal access to reliable healthcare information. And this is where HIFA steps in. It tries to address these three weaknesses. So we're not primarily a provider of information. We're more of a, a, a catalyst and a learning network. So first of all, to strengthen communication, we bring people together on virtual discussion forums. And we have uh, now 20,000 members in 180 countries interacting on virtual discussion forums in four languages, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. The discussion forums are asynchronous. So people write contributions. These are moderated to make sure that, uh, that they are on, on topic. Um, so they happen on a 24-7 basis, but people can come in and out as they want to. With regards to understanding information needs and how to meet them, this happens in two main ways. First of all, there are spontaneous discussions that occur in relation to whatever might be uh, the current priorities. So as you can imagine, when the, we during the COVID pandemic, we had the longest discussion ever with almost 2,000 messages being exchanged. And this was uh, written up in the Journal of Medi uh, Medical Internet Research in Epidemiology. We also have planned discussions where sponsors such as WHO um, give us uh, some money to run a, a year of discussions on a particular subject. And an example here is where we, we worked with Norwegian Research Council funding to look at mobile phone use by health workers. And thirdly, we have a concept only of the Hear for Voices database. So we have a prototype that works, but we're looking for funding to actually be able to, um, to implement it. Secondly, we aim to support advocacy for universal access. So we're, we bring together over 400 organizations in support of universal access, including uh, the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. And we also advocate for high level commitment. So we worked with the British Medical Association and finally got a policy by, from the World Medical Association um, to commit to universal access. And we're hoping to do this with other stakeholder groups in the system. Most important of all is leadership and advocacy for this whole system. And HIFA is much too small to be able to do this on our own. There's growing consensus that WHO would be the natural champion for universal access. And we believe that WHO is actually ready now to commit explicitly to this. It's already present in WHO's 1948 constitution that the extension to all peoples of the benefits of medical knowledge is essential to health. Last year, we became in official relations with WHO. And this year, the Deputy Director General um, wrote a paper with co-authors on universal health information is essential <clears throat> for universal health coverage. So clearly we're in a situation where WHO is on the verge of committing to universal access. And this will be a game changer because it will mean that there will be a major champion behind this goal. But to make this happen, we need a catalyst. 
And the catalyst is you, us, the stakeholders in the global evidence ecosystem, including not just those with the professional interest, but patients and the general public as well. So if you do one thing after this webinar, please fill out our global survey. It only will take five minutes and we need your voice. I'll just like to say thank you to the National Institute for Health and Care Research and the Elsevier Foundation who have supported our survey and technical support and complimentary publicity from the organizations you can see there. So lastly, what you can do is please complete the survey, join here for yourself, and if you have any questions about any of this, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Neil and all. Um, we have time for a Q&A and a discussion. Um, so I wanna welcome those questions in the um, Q&A function of Zoom. If um, you can put those in, our speakers will take them. One question that came up is regarding how to bridge language divides in real time, either synchronously or asynchronously. Um, you know, Neil, you discussed that the discussion um, convenings are actually in four different languages. Does anyone have comments on how to bridge language in real time, either synchronously or asynchronously in virtual settings? I'll, I'll start us off. Um, I, I think there's multiple, luckily, um, all of the asynchronous kinds of tools offer, you know, you could either use a Google translate or sometimes there's automatic um, translation tools like in, I think WhatsApp. And so that makes it much easier. And, you know, for people who are not speaking the native language of the collaboration, it takes a lot of courage. So that's to be said. And then synchronously, um, I think it's an actual opportunity for people who are the native language speakers to start being more conscious of how to communicate with people who are speaking um, a second language and also for the second language learners to push their language and for that um, to happen and the, for the students to be um, trying to speak each other's language and build that equity together. But then um, there are things like Streamer, which you can attach to Zoom. Zoom is now offering translation tools um, when you're together in person. Sometimes people bring in, if the native language is English, um, people bring in um, people who have participated before so they can act as allies. And um, But I don't want to hog up the space. Other people go for it. Yes, with uh, with HIFA, we have, we have separate um, discussion forums for each language of the four languages. Mm. Uh, but it does look increasingly that real-time translation will be possible, or already is possible. Um, there is a cost to it, which we can't meet at the moment, but it is going to be possible within the next few years for multiple people with multiple languages to be able to interact almost seamlessly uh, including through um, written asynchronous communication. So I think that's something that we can all look forward to. Uh, one, one point, of course, about tr machine translation is that there is a risk of error, and therefore uh, there are certain types of communication that are not well suited to machine translation, such as um, clinical information, dosages of medicines and so on, um, but when one is sharing experience and when a an error in the translation is not going to be consequential, uh, then then it's a really useful tool. And we look forward to being able to 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 do this much more. 
an upside of AI. Ro, I saw you speaking, I think. Yes, I didn't have the mute off. This is less about language, but about communication. And I just thought it might be appropriate to add that even with students from different backgrounds speaking the one language, barriers to communication, quite apart from language, really need to be considered. And we certainly have a particular type of um, behaviour in Australia, which might be equivalent to talking whether you know the answer or not, and more respectful cultures may say much less. And we've really noted that we need to work very well with students to get them to communicate when we're using these cross-cultural platforms. Thank you. You know, we have, a lot of us have reflected on um, virtual interactions and the comfort and normalcy of that really being a silver lining of the COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder if you might speak to your educational institutions or the funding institutions you're interacting with and how in, you see institutions grappling with in-person in person versus virtual uh, learning? And what are some of the compelling arguments for scaling virtual approaches that have been successful for you? Feel free to unmute and uh, speak in turn. I might just set us off on this and share that uh, certainly reflecting on the growth of virtual engagement and opportunities through COVID um, has certainly meant that technologically there has certainly been a growth in access in many, many places. Um, however, there has been a fair bit of debate whether that has translated into better learning outcomes for students, both in the online learning space and not, and that debate intention does exist. Uh, for example, coming from a medical school where we do have more of a focus on face-to-face -face engagement, we've seen more of a push for students to come back face-to-face -face as opposed to virtual engagement. Um, having said that again very quickly, um, student expectations from university providers is also changing, and there is a very big growth in student equity and being able to cater to the needs of students who may be returning to education as mature age students or students with additional needs. And that's a space where certain universities like the University of Canberra really is pushing for equity for students in their engagement. Any other thoughts on compelling arguments um, for the virtual approach? I'll jump in. <laughs> I think, um... And I also am wanting to speak to Jennifer Casper's note about the colonial history and power imbalances and how that influences who speaks and who doesn't. And I think that when we're working virtually, it's a start. Um, it's a beginning. It's an opportunity to try something. And um, we oftentimes with COIL and virtual exchange and probably RO and Danish also push forth this idea of creating a brave space, that um, this is an opportunity to really start to engage about um, these inequities and how to um, even prepare the student ahead of time, the col colonizer, um, those students, how to prepare them before they engage and also the ones who have been colonized, how to, elevate and um, shift the power dynamic in the relationship during the collaboration, having the students really meaningfully have to grapple with these issues. And when you were also talking about scaling up, were you also talking about size, laying, um, large, like um, scaling up in terms of that, Jessica, or were you just talking about scaling up I think scaling up, but also getting funding, support, endorsement, um, recognition for the value, um, translation to credit, things like that. Okay. Can the I current just... the currencies of higher education? Okay. If I can just jump in on that one too, 
in the United States, we are late to the game to support virtual exchange, but it's starting to happen. American Association of Colleges and Universities is recognizing virtual exchange as a pedagogic practice that should be um, that all students should participate in, but we are late to the table. Many countries already are supporting doing this work and putting dollars into professional development to institutions and to the education community in South Africa, in Japan, in the Netherlands, in Canada, in um, uh, Mexico, in Chile, in Colombia, in Brazil. Many countries recognize that doing this virtual work is a stepping stone and that they're you know, we have people who are involved in telehealth right here on this call, that this is a way for students to prepare. Yes, it's not perfect. Of course, there's so much to learn. And yes, the colonizer powers are still, you know, fraught with how we do this, uh, scratching our heads often, but it's a way that we have to get the conversation going. Thank you. Um, Akiki, I wanted to bring you in on this question. Um, in terms of the walking the talk and the virtual kind of community immersion and walking in the shoes of patients and healthcare workers, um, are you seeing that subsequent to that, employers and um, future jobs are valuing that international or excuse me, that virtual experience the same as they would in person experiences? Right. Um, maybe I will. I will um, actually speak more towards the hybrid, the hybrid of virtual and and in person. And for us, the importance that this must continue, um, and that the that the virtual must not be at the expense of of the in person. And we find that it is such a it's such a, a a temptation, especially for we find for our 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 students to, you know, it has forced us all to change the way we teach, the way we engage. But I think it has also shown us that uh, that it does not take a lot of sophistication for you know to move to to technology, to move to virtual um, modalities. And uh, that we can we can we can translate the virtual, I mean the you know the real time to the virtual, but still know that the virtual is the I mean that the the that the real experiences are the basis of the virtual, and not you know and not forget what is behind that because in fact now we have a hybrid for our our like masters courses, and so it puts the you know the students at par with what's you know what with what is going on globally uh you know global health leaders and um i think also to push the imbalances of power that the teachers are not just within the walls the teachers are out in community the teachers are patients the teachers are on the paths of life that you know that we traverse and that that there should be that flow in and out flow. And that's why I'm really excited about all the other platforms that you have talked about, about the universal knowledge, about, about what Ro is doing, those collaborations and different people from different cultures and backgrounds collaborating in this work. And I think indeed we are the catalysts and we are the ones who keep the balance and not leave it to some technocrats who don't have you know the the benefit of both worlds thank you thank you akiki yeah to wrap us up i think what we're hearing is that it's a stepping stone um and not necessarily a destination um and a catalyst and i appreciate everyone being here who's catalyzing this work in various ways um i'm hoping that we'll have more future webinars exploring this topic and including assessment evaluation um, and the cultural immersion piece so thank you everyone for joining us today and for cgh for convening thank you